Hey, thanks for watching. This is Helio Wave. I just want to start off by saying that I know the content is a little all over the place, subject wise. But I just started making videos a couple months ago, and I want to try new things just to make sure I am improving. That being said, videos like the Phantom Time Hypothesis, Why We Believe in Ghosts, Disclosure, and this one, The Simulation Theory, are interesting to research and to produce in general, so I will be focusing on topics like these. I'm sure you've all heard the saying before, write what you know, or make a video on what you know. But I guess I'm seeking that elusive red pill, trying to expand my mind and knowledge in all areas. That was the goal of this channel. So if there is a topic you would like covered, leave a comment. And if you liked the video, help me out and subscribe. All right, so enough with the beer now. We should start with some background information. The simulation hypothesis, or simulation theory, is the proposition that all of reality, including the Earth and the universe, is in fact an artificial simulation, most likely a computer simulation. Some versions rely on the development of a simulated reality, a proposed technology that would seem realistic enough to convince its inhabitants the simulation was real. There is a long philosophical and scientific history to the underlying thesis that reality is an illusion. This skeptical hypothesis can be traced back to antiquity. A skeptical hypothesis is a hypothetical situation which can be used in an argument for skepticism about a particular claim or class of claims. Usually, the theory posits the existence of a deceptive power that deceives our senses and undermines the justification of knowledge otherwise accepted as justified. For example, to the butterfly dream of Zhang Zhi. Zhang Zhao, commonly known as Zhang Zhi, was an influential Chinese philosopher who lived around the 4th century BC during the Warring States period, a period corresponding to the summit of Chinese philosophy hundred schools of thought. He is credited with writing, in part or in whole, a work known by his name, the Zhongzhi, which is one of the foundational texts of Taoism. The most famous of all his stories, Zheng Zhao Dreams of Being a Butterfly, appears at the end of the second chapter on the equality of things. Once Zheng Zhao dreamed he was a butterfly, a butterfly flittering and fluttering about, happy with himself and doing as he pleased. He didn't know that he was Zheng Zhao. Suddenly he woke up, and there he was, solid and unmistakable Zheng Zhao. But he didn't know if he was Zheng Zhao who had dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming that he was Zheng Zhao. Between Zheng Zhao and the butterfly, there must be some distinction. This is called the transformation of things. The well-known image of Zhang Zhi wondering if he was a man who dreamed of being a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming of being a man, is so striking that whole dramas have been written on its theme. In it, Zhang Zhi plays with the theme of transformation, illustrating that the distinction between waking and dreaming is another false dichotomy. If one distinguishes them, how can one tell if one is now dreaming or awake? or the Indian philosophy of Maya. Maya literally means illusion or magic. It has multiple meanings in Indian philosophies depending on the context. In ancient Vedic literature, Maya literally implies extraordinary power and wisdom. In later Vedic texts and modern literature dedicated to Indian traditions, Maya connotes a magic show an illusion where things appear to be present, but are not what they seem. Maya is also a spiritual concept. That which exists, but is constantly changing, and thus is spiritually unreal. And the power or the principle that conceals the true character of spiritual reality. So the concept that reality is not as it seems has deep roots within the human psyche. It appears that we have been contemplating this possibility since the dawn of philosophical communication. 
when the human race began spreading ideas and trying to rationalize our strange existence. And these existential questions continue to puzzle many of us today. A version of the simulation hypothesis was first theorized as part of a philosophical argument on part of René Descartes, and later by Hans Moerenbeck. The philosopher Nick Bostrom developed an expanded argument examining the probability of our reality being a simulation. Nick Bostrom is a Swedish-born philosopher at the University of Oxford. Known for his work on existential risk and anthropic principle, human enhancement ethics, superintelligent risks, and the reversal test. In 2011, he founded the Oxford Martin Program on the impacts of future technology and is the founding director for the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. And in 2009 and in 2015, he was included in the Foreign Policy's Top 100 Global Thinkers list. And Nick certainly has some interesting thoughts on the simulation hypothesis. Maybe in the future, with vastly more powerful computers, you could build more complex virtual realities with more complex simulated creatures inside them. Maybe these creatures could be complex enough that they would actually have brains like ours simulated down to the level of individual neurons and synapses such that the inhabitants of these simulations would be conscious. But what the simulation argument adds to that is that Instead of just stopping at the question of how could you ever prove with certainty that we are not in a simulation ourselves, the simulation argument tries to establish a constraint about what we can believe, and it tries to show that one of three possibilities is true, although it doesn't tell us which one of them it is. Okay. Um, now, in a sense, this sounds more radical even perhaps than some of the multiverse theories that we've it's heard, but in radical. another sense, it's less because it doesn't presuppose any unknown physics. So we are just assuming that it would be possible to build computers that are much more powerful in the future. So what the com simulation argument tries to show is that one of three possibilities is true. The first one is that almost all civilizations at our stage of technological development go extinct before they become technologically mature. Technologically mature meaning having developed all those technologies we can currently show are physically possible given only uncontroversially obtainable physics. So they make a radio, they make a rocket ship, they make a bomb, Yeah, you can build big computers the size of planets and stuff. We can calculate what performance they would have. We can't build them now, but maybe a thousand years from now people okay. will build them. So first possibility is People at our stage, they just fail to get through to that level of technological maturity. Maybe they destroy themselves on the way. Second possibility is that almost all civilizations that do reach technological maturity lose interest in creating these kinds of ancestor simulations, as I call them. These would be detailed computer simulations of people like their historical predecessors. So they have these powerful computers, they have the ability to program them, but they have better things to do with their computers and their time. Okay, here comes three. I'm right, and three. the third possibility is that we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. <laughs> um, and the argument, in its full version, it requires some probability theory, but the gist of it can be grasped quite simply and intuitively. So if you imagine that um, the first two possibilities do not obtain, that means some non-negligible fraction of civilizations at our stage do reach technological maturity, and some non-negligible fraction of those you know, are interested in creating these ancestor simulations. They devote some non-trivial fraction of the resources to this end. You can then show that there would be many, many more ancestor simulations than there would be original courses of history, because... Why would there be more because, simulations? Because if you calculate the computing power that a technologically mature civilization would have, and the computing power that would be required to simulate all human brains, it turns out that the latter quantity is a tiny, tiny fraction of the former. So, in other words, by devoting a tiny fraction of their computational resources to this end, they could create astronomical numbers, billions and billions and billions. So, billions so you're saying that if the assignment in Mrs. Maggetti's class on the planet Xantar in another universe is, all right, everybody, I want you to make a universe 
with extraordinary accuracy and amount you to create a billion people with every neuron in place so they all think they're alive. Everybody go. And then Johnny says, can I do it with real matter? Can I, can I make it with like energy and mass? And he said, no, Johnny, that would require 50 tons of stuff. We're just going to do this with bits and bytes. So everybody in the class does it with bits and bytes. And then in the next year, people just keep hitting the repeat button. And right. So, so the if, cost of making a pretend universe is just infinitely smaller than making a real one? What? Maybe not infinitely, but a lot smaller. I mean, to the point where if you have the ability to use some advanced form of nanotechnology to transform planets into computational systems, by using just one planetary computer, just a millionth of its computing power for a tiny fraction of one second, you could run many, many courses of you know, simulations of human history. So if Johnny so, goes, beep, 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 well, beep, 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 that means that, 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 that creates the likelihood that we're in one of those universes. Well, right? or maybe Johnny just does one, but maybe there are other people millions of years later that repeat <laughs> it. Now, over time, there would be more simulations. How do you wake up in the morning? Uh, <laughs> well, if the first two are false, the first two assumptions, you then reach this conclusion that there would be many more simulations than originals. And if almost all people with our types of experiences were simulated rather than implemented you know, in basic level reality, we should think that we are probably one of the typical people, the simulated ones, rather than the very exceptional ones that, that were part of the original history. So now this doesn't show wait, that wait, we are you, in the computer When you thought up this idea and you proposed to yourself that maybe it would be more likely that we're all simulated well, than Well, except we that I don't believe well, you that. you don't believe that. No. Okay. So I think that, Good. well, I believe the simulation argument which shows that one of those three is true, but it doesn't tell us which one. So I think we should distribute our credence over each of these three possibilities. We just don't have enough evidence to pick one. Um, so, that's what I believe. Now, so as to why I, you know, if we assume for the sake of the argument that it's the third possibility, the simulation hypothesis that's true, then a lot of people's first reaction is, well, you know, we might just as well go crazy. Anything could happen. But once you start reflecting on it for a little while, you realize that even if we are in a simulation, you know, the best way to predict what will happen next to decide what to do are still the methods that we would use anyway. We observe patterns in our simulated reality, we extrapolate them, and uh, act accordingly. So the implications are not quite as radical as they might at first seem. So just as we saw, Bostrom's simulation argument posits that at least one of the following statements is likely to be true. Number one, the fraction of human level civilizations that reach a post-human stage is very close to zero. Number two, the fraction of post-human civilizations that are interested in running ancestor simulations is very close to zero. And number three, the fraction of all people with our kind of experiences that are living in a simulation is very close to one. It is then possible to argue that, if this were the case, we would be rational to think that we are likely among the simulated minds rather than among the original biological ones. Nick Bostrom is far from alone in his beliefs regarding the possible consequences with the creation of AI, which all ties into the simulation theory. In his 2014 book, Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies, Bostrom reasoned that the creation of a superintelligent being represents a possible means to the extinction of mankind. And this might be a good transition into the next section, moving on from Nick Bostrom and on to another brilliant individual who holds some of the same concerns as Nick, Elon Musk. Let's take a look at a clip. I'm sure you've all seen it before, but this is from 2016, after Elon Musk took a question from somebody in the crowd. There's a um, sort of a philosophic concept that a sufficiently advanced civilization will be able to create uh, so a simulation. simulation. Yeah, maybe you've answered this before? A simulation. I've had so many simulation discussions, it's crazy. Okay. Um, so, because... In fact, it, it got to the point where basically every conversation was, was the AI, AI slash simulation conversation 
Um, and my brother and I finally agreed that um, we would ban such conversations if we were ever in a hot tub. Okay. That was like, because <laughs> that really well, kills the magic. We're in a hot tub, um, so, so, so the idea is right, any sufficiently advanced civilization would create, could create a simulation that's like our existence. And so the theory follows that may, maybe we're in the simulation. Have you thought about this? And a lot. Are we? <laughs> are we? Even I, in hot tubs. To know, so much so it had to be banned from a hot tub. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's not the sexiest conversation. Are we in? Are we in? Um, the, 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 I mean, I think here's, in my mind, like the, the, the strongest argument for, the, for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that, that 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. Mm -hmm. And soon we'll have virt you know, virt virtual reality, we'll have augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in, indistinguishable. Um, e even if that rate of advancement drops by a thousand from what it is right now, um, then you just say, okay, well, well let's imagine it's a 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC or whatever, and there would probably be you know, billions of such uh, you know, computers or set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. So Tell me what's wrong with that argument. Is the answer yes? <laughs> the argument is probably. I mean, I just like. Is there is there a flaw in that argument? I mean, someone. But someone. I'm not that, sure what but, the error. In, all right, no, no. The argument makes sense. So the assumption then is that somebody beat us to it, and this is a game. No, no. There's a one in billions chance that this is base reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this, this that seems to be. Like clearly, what the you know what the, what it, what it suggests, right. and and actually, I mean, arguably, we should hope that that's true, because otherwise, if if civilization stops advancing, then that may be due to some calamitous event that erases civilization. So maybe we should be hopeful that this is a simulation, because otherwise, because they could reboot it. Well, otherwise. Either we're going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality, or civilization will cease to exist. And in 2018, Musk would elaborate a little further while speaking with Joe Rogan. And let's just take a look at the clip right here. Well, the argument for the simulation, I think, is quite strong. Because if you assume any improvement at all over time, any improvement, 1%, 0.1%, just extend the time frame, Make it a thousand years, a million years. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. What would a, what, civilization, if you count it, if you're very generous, civilization is maybe seven or eight thousand years old, if you count it from the first writing. This is nothing. This is nothing. Um, so if you assume any rate of improvement at all, then games will be indistinguishable from reality. Or civilization will end. One of those two things will occur. I think most likely, this is just about probability, there are many, many simulations. These simulations are, we might as well call them reality, or you could call them the multiverse. These simulations you believe are created? Like someone has manufactured? They're running on the substrate. So that substrate is probably boring. Boring? Mm -hmm. How so? <laughs> well, when we create a simulation, like a game or a movie, it's the distillation of what's interesting about life. I think most likely, if we're a simulation, it's really boring outside the simulation. After this, I tried researching what he meant by the substrate. 
I couldn't find any information regarding this besides the generic definition. But I feel like there's a lot more to this than the common term. I understand what he's saying. The simulations are running on an underlying channel of some sort. But the way he says it gives me this feeling that he knows something definitive regarding the quote-unquote substrate. He just talks about it with conviction. I don't know what exactly I'm trying to say, but I will be keeping my ear to the ground waiting to hear this term thrown around again in the future. There's something more there. I can see what he's getting at though, I think we all do. The rate of improvement regarding video games is unreal. According to many experts, full immersion virtual reality games aren't that far off. With new technologies emerging such as the Virtuox Omni and always improving headsets, I mean Half-Life Alex was a major breakthrough, and given the rate of improvement and with the next gen consoles coming out soon, it wouldn't surprise me if we get to the full immersion point within this decade. Closer to 2030, but still. Although this does add credence to the argument. However, it is the wrong argument, isn't it? We aren't contemplating if we will create a simulation universe. But rather that it already happened, and we are currently living in it. One headline that caught my attention when it was first announced was when physicist Jim Gates discovered what he says is computer code in the math that underlies our world. From what I understand, he and his team essentially found binary code, mathematical equations within the fabric of the universe to autocorrect mistakes. It follows a distinct, predetermined code. Now, I do not claim to be an expert. I may be reaching and I certainly claim to only have a layman's understanding of physics, and let's face it, math too. But interestingly, in the clip we are about to play, Jim Gates explains what they found, and he also gives an argument against the simulation hypothesis. However, the argument he chose to use doesn't quite sway my opinion, to say the least. But let's check it out. There, there have been various models about how the cosmos is structured you know, over the, the centuries. And you know, at one point, people talked about the clockwork universe that we lived in. And now, the, the computer is often the, the metaphor for how the universe is structured. And, and Jim, I know you've done some work on this whole idea of maybe, maybe we should take that idea more seriously. No, we shouldn't. <laughs> but you forced me to a point where I have to speak. So I don't know how familiar the audience is, uh, is with uh, some of my research, but uh, leading a group of both mathematicians and physicists uh, ab about uh, 10 years ago, we found an extraordinary result in some of the equations that are part of string theory. As I said, what I really do is I work on a subject called supersymmetry. So it's got symmetry in it, but it's got more symmetry than you probably should want to ever see. Um, in this con the mathematical context of such equations, we have discovered that there are mathematical structures that are indistinguishable from error correcting codes, as does occur in digital um, information transmission and uh, establishing reliable digital information tran uh, transmission. And because of this, many people have uh, concluded that the work that I and my team um, completed means that the universe in which we live uh, must resemble the science fiction movie The Matrix, where we're all some kind of simulation of some program running, and um, that's uh, exciting for a lot of people. It's in a fact, little unnerving. Well, and then, there, of course, you have Brian, you have uh, Bostrom, Nick Bostrom, a philosopher, who has really, you know, uh, put this point front and center uh, for the public and for... Uh, he says the computers will take over. Yeah, yeah. He basically says that we're all just simulations. Um, I like to point out to people a couple of things with that uh, that I find problematic with that. One is if you accept that, then you have to also accept the, the existence of ghosts. Existence of? Ghost. Edgar Allan Poe, ghost. Oh, okay. Ghost. <laughs> right? Why? Why, Why? Because if we are simulations, there's some kind of substructure that we don't have access to that runs us as an app. As long so when we die what does that mean? It means that that particular app was not was uh, ended that the I'm sorry that the app stopped running. Right? 
But if that underlying superstructure still exists, and if there's no damage to the codeware, whoever is running this superstructure can re-enable a app, let's say Jim Gates, 500 years from now. So Jim Gates comes back as a ghost. It's built into the idea <laughs> that the universe is a simulation. This doesn't sound like the universe I exist in. <laughs> so although many people like to say my work supports simulation theory, I actually believe that it's pointing to something far more beautiful and subtle about the nature of the laws of physics. So with knowing that mathematical equations have been found in the makeup of our universe, well, it is unbelievably interesting, and I believe it adds to the credibility of the argument. But I do want to mention this quick. I recently heard the simulation theory used as an explanation as to why we haven't contacted anybody else in the universe. And it is worth noting in my opinion. So at some point in time, civilizations reach a moment where their technological prowess opens up other possibilities. And it is through their tech, it is revealed that instead of venturing out into the universe to explore, and exposing themselves to all of the dangers, exploring within through simulations of the universe is the more logical way to go. A civilization that chose this route could employ avatars, never subjecting their true biological bodies to harm in any way. Possibilities could be endless, mirror images of the universe so scientific data still has value, and the ability, although this is highly speculative, but why not? If they chose the codes to use, they could manipulate time, making minutes into years, decades, essentially rendering themselves immortal. So I'll leave you all with this. If by Elon Musk's math, we are the one in a billion where this is real, and we are not currently in a simulation. And our civilization reaches that monumental moment in history where we can plug in, freely, explore, live, and experience anything you would want without fear. You will be immortal, digitally. Although, would we be able to tell the difference? Anyway, my question is, would you take that jump and dive into the simulated world? Or would you choose to live out your life naturally? A question that you might have to ask yourself one day. That is, as long as we have a choice in the matter. Probability is against us. This could already be a simulation. Hey, thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. Once again, this is Healy Wave. If you would like to check out another video, you can do that right here. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, remember to challenge your cognition.